It is so good to see you today. This is our Ask Anything weekend, and uh, you are going to be extremely blessed today. Hopefully, uh, you have already had the opportunity uh, to make an introduction, get to know Dr. Hugh Ross, famous astrophysicist, scientist, and one of the brightest guys that I know, smartest guys I know. Last week, last night, uh, not last week, last night, he talked about the cosmic reasons, as you look at the universe, the cosmic reasons to believe in Christ. Uh, in the 9.30 hour, he shared a message entitled, An Atheist Scientist Ponders the Cosmos. And then in this hour, we're just going to have open mic Q&A. Now, we've got two mics, one mic here, one mic there. We also are allowing online questions. So Bo, from time to time, will come back out, represent an online question that has been asked as we weave in between. Now, here are some ground rules, okay? Uh, first of all, you better get your thinking cap on. And you also need to understand, especially here at Cottonwood Creek, we're not afraid of talking about science and the Bible. Uh, they don't conflict with each other. They confirm each other. That's what we believe, and that's what uh, Dr. Hugh Ross talks about over and over and over again. The more we discover about our universe and about our world, the more it screams for a creator. And so that's really what this is all about. So here are the ground rules on the questions, okay? First of all, here at Cottonwood Creek, we don't allow any softball questions, okay? A few baseball questions, but no softball questions. I'm kidding. No easy questions, no layup questions. We want you to ask hard questions. Second thing, if you have more than one question, all right, we're going to invite you to ask one question, then go to the back of the line, all right? So just one question. That way others can have the opportunity uh, to ask questions along the way. And then the third rule is this, no seven-minute questions. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We want to be able to roll through these questions, give uh, Dr. Ross an opportunity uh, to answer all of your questions. So let's give a fantastic Cottonwood Creek welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross. There we go. All right, and if you want to begin to make your way uh, to one of the mics, if you have a question you want to ask, feel free to do that online. Feel free to do that. Uh, I've already taken one offline uh, uh, from online, and here it is. Let's start with a softball question, and it was about evolution, all right? Uh, can evolution or does ev evolution explain uh, why we're here? why we are where we are, and really kind of the question, does the fossil record basically support the evolutionist claim? So I engage a lot of, is this microphone on? Let's here? make sure we get it on. There we go. Think. There we go. How's Try that? that? Is that working? Okay, good. Yeah, I get to engage a lot of evolutionary biologists when I speak on university campuses, and their idea is natural selection, Mutations and gene exchange explain how you can go from bacteria up to human beings. But if you actually look at the fossil record, what you notice is that you don't get the evolutionary prediction of having all these species proliferate and create new genera and have those proliferate and you get uh, new families, new orders, new classes, and new phyla. What you see instead is the phyla show up first and they show up suddenly and simultaneously, and then you get the classes, and then you get the orders, and the families, the genera. It's the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a naturalistic perspective. And as I engage evolutionary biologists, I say, well, you're only looking at genetics and the fossils. You also need to look at the physics of the Earth and the sun and the moon. And they say, what do you mean? I says, well, they're changing. The sun today is 23% brighter than it was uh, when the first life appeared on planet Earth. And life can't tolerate a major change in the sun's brightness. But what happens is you've got a god that removes life from planet Earth, replaces it with new life, where that new life is more efficient at drawing greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. And only a mind that knows the future physics of the sun, the Earth, and the moon would know which life to remove and which new life to replace that with. And you actually see that in the longest of the creation psalms, Psalm 104, verses 29 and 30. It's the property of all life to die off, but God recreates and renews the face of the earth, but does it in such a way, as you see in Psalm 104, that you have the maximum biomass 
and the maximum biodiversity for the maximum time so we humans can have all the biodeposits we need to launch and sustain our civilization. Amen. All right. That's a good one. All right. I uh, appreciate That's exactly what I was thinking as well. That's Very exactly good. that was exactly the answer I'd like to give. Go ahead and step up to the mic and uh, kind of tell everybody who you are and then ask the question. Yeah. Good morning. This is Fadi Atiyeh and this is Amir. And we were really thinking, is it possible that there is life outside of planet Earth? Does it conflict with the Bible? Or is that okay to something to think of? Okay, the question was, is there life outside of planet Earth? And would that, if we discovered, conflict with the Bible? Christians have been debating this uh, for over 2,000 years. And uh, one group of Christian theologians says, when we read the Bible, God seems to really like to create. He's not going to stop with planet Earth. He's going to be creating life on many different planets. Other theologians say, well, when you read the Gospels, God does not waste miracles. He performs as few as are necessary to fulfill his purpose. And his purpose can be fulfilled with having intelligent uh, spiritual life on just one planet. And as you heard me say in the first service, we really need the entirety of the universe just to get that uh, one planet. And uh, I've been on record since the 1980s. We will find the remains of life on virtually every solar system body for the simple reason that big meteors have been striking planet Earth, and a big enough one will export Earth's soil throughout our solar system. So I wrote a paper years ago making the point that we need to go back to the moon, because we'll never find the fossils of Earth's first life here on planet Earth, because Earth's geology has destroyed them all. But the moon has almost no geological activity, and therefore we can go back to the moon and we'll find the pristine fossils of Earth's first life. And I got to speak about this to the NASA Houston scientists and astronauts and saying, we need to go back to the moon. And the NASA can take credit for resolving the big creation evolution debate. Are the theists right about the origin of life or are the atheists right about the origin of life? Because both camps predict very different things about what those first fossils will look like. And as I told those NASA scientists and astronauts, last time I checked, 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base was made up either by theists or atheists. So everybody should be excited about going to the moon and figuring it out. <laughs> now, we can also find them on Mars, but Mars has only 200 kilograms of Earth's soil for every 100 square kilometers. The moon has got over 20,000 kilograms. So the moon's the easiest place to go to find that. On the other hand, Earth microbes cannot be transported beyond our solar system. And as an astronomer, I can tell you, everywhere we look beyond our solar system, we see conditions that are hostile to life. So, so far, it looks like we're it. We're it. All right. Very good. Uh, state your name and your question. Hi, I'm, I'm can you hear me? Is this yeah. on? Okay, great. Uh, I'm Charles Sanders. Um, the question I have is more of about your approach. I find that in sharing my faith, time is a factor. The, the interactions are typically spontaneous and not planned. Um, and people will engage with questions about the cosmological argument or the astrological argument for a long time because that's interesting to everyone. Uh, but when it comes to getting to, okay, I've said this evidence, the creator is God, the God of the Bible. Um, what is the segue that you use to get there from your cosmological evidence. Okay, you're making a good point that when we have these encounters with people, sometimes we got two and a half hours like I had on that airplane. Sometimes you only got 15 seconds. Sometimes you got three minutes. When it says always be ready with good reasons, you need to have reasons that you can get out in 15 seconds uh, or a minute or three minutes. So like the skeptics class I teach, I basically have the Christians practice uh, engaging people where they only got three minutes, or one minute, or 20 seconds, or where they got half an hour. And there is no silver bullet. You need to have a multiplicity of silver bullets. You need to have many good reasons prepared, because every non-Christian is different. And so what you need to do is ask questions. And by the way, people like talking about themselves, so that's really easy to do. 
to ask people questions. Hey, what do you do for a living? Where do you live? Uh, that way you get to find out what kind of non-Christian you're dealing with and figure out, okay, this is the piece of evidence that they need. And typically that takes a few minutes. And so I look for those opportunities where I know I'm going to have five minutes. If I'm in a long grocery line, then I know I'm going to have about five minutes. And so uh, I look for those opportunities. By the way, I never get angry when I'm in a long line of people because then I know I actually got the time to find out uh, what their issue is and be able to share that with them briefly. Yeah. So I was reading a book and the indication was that uh, based on a half-life... Tom, life, talk a little louder. Yeah, you need to get really close to the microphone. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, a lot better. Okay. Um, I read about the half-life of carbon on the Earth mm -hmm. and uh, the indication from this scientist was that the Earth is probably no more than about 8,000 years old. I'm hearing you say 13.5 billion for the entire universe. Does that include the Earth, and is there evidence as to the actual age of the Earth itself? Okay, is there actual evidence for the age of the Earth itself? Yes. Uh, we scientists have dozens of different ways of determining the age of the universe. Uh, the one that gives the greatest precision is not looking at uh, radiocarbon, but rather looking at the decay of uh, uranium-238, 235, and thorium-232. They decay into three different isotopes of lead, lead-208, 207, and 206. And lead only comes from the radiometric decay of uranium, thorium, and plutonium. The plutonium's all gone, uh, so we don't uh, concern ourselves with that. But the bottom line is, uh, by looking at uranium, thorium, and those three isotopes of lead, you get six independent methods for measuring the age of the Earth. And because some of those radiometric decay rates are very close to the age of the Earth, you get high precision. You say, how high of a precision? Uh, well, uh, we now have a measure of the age of the Earth, uh, 4.5, uh, billion years, plus or minus 0 0.001 billion. So we now know it to uh, four places uh, of the decimal. Uh, so, and with radiocarbon, its half-life is 5,715 years. Uh, and with all radiometric tools, it's only reliable within a factor of seven of the half-life. So multiply those 5,715 years by seven and divide by seven, that's the range in which you're gonna get reliable dates. Outside that, you won't. And that applies to every radiometric tool. Uh, the book I wrote, A Matter of Days, I have a whole chapter there on how to use radiometric dating uh, to determine ages for things. So for example, uh, we ha can use radiocarbon to determine the dates of some Bible manuscripts to plus or minus nine months. But when we do it with a Shroud of Turin, we don't get an accurate date because it falls outside uh, of that uh, date range. Anyway, a matter of days, uh, we go into that in some detail. All right, very good. Oh, gosh. I don't know how I'm going to reach this, but... Um, Bo I'm, will help you with that. I'm very tiny. Um, so, hi, I'm Holland, and um, as someone who wants to be an astrophysicist um, themselves, I have... Yay! I have um, just a very uh, main question that I want to ask you. So, uh, as of... Today, we've recently discovered uh, multiple galaxies out in space, and I just want to know what's your take on that and its relation that, um, or, uh, or how could that connect to um, the Bible and Christianity and um, maybe why or how God made those different galaxies out there and just maybe like never mentioned them in the Bible or mentioned them in a way that, like, you know, <laughs> sorry. Well, I understand the question. <laughs> and uh, there's a reason why galaxies are not mentioned in the Bible. The Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit to communicate to all generations of humanity. So it uses vocabulary uh, that is meaning for all generations. So notice the Bible says nothing about protons, because people didn't know what a proton was until the 20th century. It says nothing about the Neanderthals. It also says nothing about galaxies. 
It wasn't until about 1910, 1912, that astronomers even knew that galaxies existed. There was a thinking that our own galaxy was the entirety uh, of the universe. Uh, but I'm glad she asked the question. I'm glad she wants to pursue a career in astrophysics. Uh, that warms my heart. Uh, <laughs> and when I was at Caltech, my research specialty was quasars and galaxies. And her question is, how does this connect uh, with our Christian faith? Well, I've got a book coming out in a few months called Design to the Core, uh, where I got three chapters on galaxies and galaxy clusters and super galaxy clusters basically making the point that just for these galaxies to even form requires extraordinary fine-tuned design by the hand of our Creator. And then you heard me say in the first service, there's 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. But as we look at those galaxies, ours is the only one that has a design features that would permit the existence of life. So when you see those Star Wars movies, a galaxy far, far away, We've already looked at those galaxies. We looked at the ones that are nearby. None of them have the characteristics that would permit the existence of life. And basically, I explain in this next book, Designed to the Core, just all the extraordinary fine tune that's necessary. Because for life to be possible, especially advanced life, the galaxy has to be of particular mass. And it has to have exquisitely symmetrical spiral arms. And your life support planet's got to be in between the spiral arms. You want the spiral arms to be far apart, where there's no feathers, feathers or spurs between the spiral arms, and it goes on and on. But, and then one of the things I do in some of my talks, I got a talk called A Galaxy Like No Other, where I show you all the other galaxies that come the closest to matching ours, then I show you our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy sticks out like a sore thumb. It's radically different from the nearest galaxies, or the, the galaxies that come the closest to meeting the characteristics. God did all this for us. He loved us so much, he didn't consider it too expensive to create a universe of a trillion trillion galaxies or a trillion trillion stars in 200 billion galaxies. There you go. Hopefully that's a good enough. We're going to slip right over here. Let Bo represent the online community real quick. So, Bo, if you can answer one that uh, was uh, brought in here. Sure. Uh, so, Bo Landers, longtime fan. Um, <laughs> so, actually, before I even get to these questions, I do have just a personal question for you, Dr. Ross. Um, did Adam have a belly button? Bo, don't answer that. Uh, that is not an online question. That oh, is a sorry. Bo Landers question. So uh, we're going to strike right. that. Okay. We'll talk after. Um, <laughs> that, it is answered on our website. See? All right. The people want to know. That's a good question, Pastor. Bo wants to know. Uh huh. I do. All right. Uh, here's a question from our online folks um, Does science tell us anything about heaven and its existence? Okay, does science tell us anything about heaven? Hey, before I get there, the people at our book table want to tell you all the books got cleaned out by the people who came to the first That's service. Right. But they got a bunch of cards out there, and if you fill them out, they'll send you the free book. The Navigating Genesis book will be sent to you free. They also said they'll give you a coupon code for a discount on all the books that got sold out. So uh, just go to the back table there. Now, what about heaven? What does the Bible uh, or science say about heaven? Well, what science does say is that there's more to the universe than the universe. Now, when I was at the University of Toronto, I took a course from Carl Sagan, and he began the course by saying, the universe is all there is or was or ever will be. And if you ever saw his video series, he repeats that throughout the video series. But we now know, thanks to the space-time theorems, that the universe is not all there is or was or ever will be. The space-time theorems uh, prove that there must be a beginning to matter, energy, space, and time, which implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created uh, the universe. So there is reality beyond the universe. We need reality beyond the universe just to explain how, how come we have a universe. And uh, we also know there are dimensions beyond length, width, height, and time. Uh, even in particle physics, we realize 
there must be at least six other space dimensions in order to explain all the particles that exist in the universe. And therefore, there must be dimensional realms beyond just the four uh, that we experience. Now, general relativity tells us that if God made 10,000 universes, our science only allows us to discover the universe in which we exist. But we know it will come to an end. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, God's going to permit this universe to exist only until that time the full number of human beings he intends to redeem from sin and evil have in fact been redeemed. When that happens, the universe will have fulfilled its purpose. What's unique about Christianity, it's a two creation model, not a one creation model. God creates the universe as a tool in his hands to eradicate evil and suffering once and for all. But once that happens, he's going to replace his universe with a new creation. And what does Corinthians tell us about that creation? It's so wonderful, so beautiful, so good and marvelous that not a single human being in this life can think or imagine how great and wonderful it will be. Sounds like a great place. Amen. Amen. All right, great answer. Uh, right here. This is Carter Mathis, 10 years old. He has a question for you. So, how do black holes and white holes regulate with the Bible? Maybe like Jesus is life or something on earth? Wow. Okay. I'm impressed. Out of board, Carter. Well, I'll begin with a technical answer <laughs> and then go to something much easier. Uh, I've been challenged by a number of my atheist peers. Hugh, you need to publish in the peer-reviewed secular literature. So I'm actually doing that now. I was doing that when I was at Caltech, of course. But recently, a few months ago, I published a paper in a secular journal, and it's titled, God's Care Revealed in Black Holes, How Black Holes Reveal God's Care. And basically should tell us, black holes are really dangerous items. But if it wasn't for black holes, we wouldn't have half a dozen of the life-crucial elements we need for our human bodies to function. And so it's the production of black holes that leads to the uh, creation of these elements. Uh, but what's incredible is that uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy, it's 35 times smaller than what we see in galaxies of a similar size. Moreover, it happens right now to be in the quietest phase of the entire existence of our Milky Way galaxy. You know, God put us here at just the right time when the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy was the quietest, and the next nearest supermassive black hole is in the Andromeda galaxy. Likewise, it too right now is in a quiet phase. And we look at the other galaxies around us, none of them have big supermassive black holes that could be dangerous to us. The one that could be a real problem for us is in uh, the supergiant galaxy in the middle of the Virgo cluster. Uh, but it's jetting away its deadly radiation in an angle that points away from us instead of towards us. And so for many reasons, God really does reveal his care to us through black holes. We need them, but we have just the right number and just the right intensity uh, of these black holes. He also want to know about white holes. Uh, black holes, as you probably are aware, are objects that are so collapsed, their gravity is so strong, that anything that gets close enough to it uh, basically gets sucked into the black hole. That's even true of light. That's why they're black, because even light can't escape uh, from a black hole. But it was Stephen Hawking that said, if you wait long enough, the black hole becomes a white hole. Uh, what happens is the black hole just keeps collapsing under its own gravity, and if you wait long enough, the black hole shrinks down to the size of a quantum particle. And when it gets that small, the forces from quantum mechanics become stronger than the force of gravity. And everything that's been sucked into the black hole will blast out as a shower of radiation. All black holes, if you wait long enough, will become white holes. You say, well, how long do we have to wait? Do I need to take this into account 
in my investment portfolio? Uh, probably not. Uh, the more massive the black hole, the longer you have to wait. The smallest black hole that physics will allow takes 10 to the 66 years to become a white hole. And the universe is only 10 to the 10 years old. So don't worry about white holes. Uh, we're going to be entering the new creation long before there's ever going to be a white hole. Very good. Great question. Yeah. Okay, so my question is about the cosmological argument. Um, so in general relativity, we talk about uh, space-like and time-like separation, and we could kind of define a sort of uh, causation out of that. Um, so I wonder how much sense it makes to talk about causality before the Big Bang with the like construction almost of time. Right. Uh, I get this from atheist physicists all the time. They say, look, our measurements only take us back to 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the cosmic creation event. And that's what's referred to as a quantum gravity era. And therefore, they speculate that maybe physics there is quite different from the physics from 10 to the minus 43 seconds up to the present time. Uh, and they said, well, uh, we can conceive of physics that's so radically different it would escape the beginning of the universe. And uh, maybe it would even uh, get around the causality principle. But it's based on pure speculation. 100% of our observations and experiments establish that the universe has a beginning. Now, what I've written about in the Crater and the Cosmos fourth edition, in the last year and a half, we have finally came up with a way to test what's going on in the quantum gravity era. And, uh, you know, Sean Carroll, a famous atheist uh, theoretical physicist at Caltech, he's produced what's called the quantum uh, eternity theorem, basically saying if the quantum space-time fluctuations are really large in the quantum gravity era, there's actually a possibility we can escape the conclusion of the space-time theorems but you need really big quantum space-time fluctuations. And here's the problem. Those quantum space-time fluctuations get magnified in the light of quasars and blazars if they come from a far enough way. So the farther the distance, the greater the magnification. The shorter the wavelength, the greater the magnification. So basically, his theorem predicts the images of distant quasars and blazars will be blurry and not sharp at short wavelengths. Well, astronomers have made measurements of uh, quasars and blazars three billion light years away at ultraviolet wavelengths, no blurriness, which means the quantum space-time fluctuations are not large. And a Christian theoretical physicist by the name of Aaron Wall has come up with a theorem, a uh, space-time theorem that applies all the way back to time equals zero based on the assumption that the quantum space-time fluctuations are not large. You'll see all that in the Crater and the Cosmos fourth edition with citations to the paper. We actually give you links to those papers so you can see them for yourself. But I'm encouraging my fellow astronomers, let's actually look at quasars and blazars that are 10 billion light years away at X-ray wavelengths, because after all, I discover my atheists are just friends who are simply retreating, saying, Okay, you blocked us out here, but we can go back to this little corner. I said, doesn't it bother you that you're being pushed back into a smaller and smaller corner of speculation? And yes, we'll never eliminate all the speculation, but that should tell us something. Right. Very Thank good. You. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ross, you mentioned additional dimensions that exist due to the rise of multiverse theories popularized by both Spider-Man and Dr. Strange. Uh, what does science have to say about the possibility of parallel universes or a multiverse? Sure. Well, I remember back in the 1980s, I've been speaking on the fine-tuned designs of the universe uh, literally since the late 1970s. But in the 1980s, I made the prediction. Eventually, the evidence for fine-tuned design uh, throughout the universe would become so compelling, atheists would have nowhere to go except to hypothesize there's an infinite number of universes where they're all different, and therefore all this fine-tuning we see is here by pure chance. 
After all, if you've got an infinite number of possibilities, anything can happen. Well, a few years back, uh, the atheist theoretical physicist Leonard Susskin said, we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse argument. It explains everything, and a model that explains everything explains nothing. And he left it there. But if you go to the creator in the Cosmos fourth edition, I give you an analogy, and very quickly I'll share it with you. If there's an infinite number of universes that are all different from the other universe, you're going to have an infinite number of planets just like planet Earth. And on those infinite number of planets, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch tree species. And birch trees peel white pieces of bark. But if you've got an infinite variety of birch tree species, some of those birch tree species will peel thin white pieces of bark that are rectangular that measure eight and a half by 11 inches. And these white pieces of bark will fall on soils that have got random chemicals in them that make random markings on those pieces of uh, uh, white bark. And with an infinite number of universes, they'll produce all the markings that we see in every research paper published by every research scientist since the beginning of time, including all their equations and diagrams and figures. And therefore, all those papers didn't come from the minds of those scientists. The multiverse did it. And so you're basically exposing that atheists who appeal to the multiverse are being inconsistent. I love uh, that you're willing to address all these things because so many times as followers of Christ and believers, uh, when we begin to have that dialogue about the faith and someone says, well, so-and-so talks about a multiverse or someone else talked about quantum <laughs> physics or quantum mechanics, well, all we can do is retreat. And you, you're not afraid of those ideas because they actually uh, lend more credibility to the faith, right? I'm not because every time I get a hard question like that, I say, let me study it and it winds up giving even a stronger case for the Christian faith we had before. So I love these hard questions from my atheist peers. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So this is a, a topic that's been in, interesting to me for like 40 years, and the frustration I have is I, I've read a number of books, and the authors give good arguments for their view, but they tend to kind of wave away. Can you get closer yeah, to the get, microphone? Get closer to so they, so they tend to kind of wave away um, or explain away contrary or confounding evidence. And, and I'm just, I wind up feeling like I've read these books and they've given me um, an explanation of the person's paradigm, but not necessarily the objective evidence a lot of times. Is it possible to, to have an uh, objective uh, apologetic or are we stuck with only giving reasons why what we believe may be true and it's still an exercise of faith to believe it? Yeah, good question. And uh, sometimes it's not a matter of evidence. People have other reasons for rejecting the God of the Bible because they might have been wounded by somebody. You know, when I find someone who's particularly intransigent and is just not responding to the evidence, as I say, can I ask you a personal question? Has you ever encountered a Christian that really offended you or wounded you? And often they just spill their guts and sometimes even start crying. Uh, and so just having that moment of compassion with people can often help you uncover uh, the real reason uh, for why uh, they're not responding to the evidence uh, that uh, you're presenting. Uh, but also I heard in that question how do you deal with people who say the evidence is not enough? I mean, I just share with you how some of my atheist friends, they keep retreating into a smaller and smaller corner where they say, well, we don't know about this, we can speculate. And uh, it's true. For us to really, because I'm, you know, one atheist friend I have said, I'm not going to believe in Jesus Christ until all the speculative doors are closed. And I said, that will never happen. For that to happen, we need to know 100% of everything there is to know about the universe. And it says, notice, we astronomers are not in danger of unemployment, where we <laughs> say, hey, we now know everything. There's nothing more to learn. Uh, in fact, the physics tells us we'll never come to the limit. But we can learn more and more and more. And as we learn more and more and more, it consistently demonstrates, as it says in Job and Psalms, the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God. 
And often what I share with my atheist friends who are kind of into the speculative mode is to say, you know, I married my wife without absolute proof that she existed. All I had was a high probability that she existed, you know, based on you know, various experiments and observations. Uh, and now I've been married to her for 44 years. And during those 44 years, I've been able to conduct a lot more experiments and observations. <laughs> and the evidence is much stronger. But even today, I do not have absolute proof that my wife exists. But I got overwhelming practical proof that she exists. And so I say to my atheist friends, I'm confident I can give you a stronger case based on evidence for the existence of God from the existence of my wife that I've been married to for 44 years. Do you think that that would be adequate? And again, I'm basically saying, you make decisions all the time based on practical proof where you lack absolute proof. We don't have absolute proof for anything, but we need to make our decisions based on practical proof and keep testing it. The Bible says, test everything, hold fast to that which is good. The problem I see with a lot of atheists, they're testing, but they're not holding fast to that which is good. If it's true, you need to hang on to it. I love that. What a great, what a great answer. And as I sit here with you, Dr. Ross, and I'm reminded you're on your pastoral staff at your church in California, uh, that we need an astrophysicist on our staff. That's kind of what I'm gathering, uh, Bo. Uh, if you can look into that for us, that'd be awesome. Okay. All right. Belly buttons, right? Okay. I got you. Yeah. Dr. Ross, my name is Ken, and a pleasure posing a question to you. Go ahead you. and talk into the mic. Sure. It's a pleasure posting a question to you. One thing I see that always disturbs me is the atheist says, we have no proof of God. You cannot prove him. Therefore, he does not exist. He's just a magical fairy dust in the sky type thing for weak people. Yet, how was the earth created? Some primordial soup was struck by lightning, and we all sprang from that. Or where did it come from? And they don't have any kind of credible answer to any of those kind of things. And it, it seems to me like it's an intellectual, um, they overlook what they don't want to see to try to build a case that's maybe more rebellion than it is disbelief. Yeah, that could be. I mean, we see this in Romans chapter 1 that uh, you know, people who don't want a relationship with God engage in what the text says is self-imposed ignorance. It's not that they haven't been exposed to the evidence. They don't want to look at the evidence. And it says, how do you deal with people like that? Well, I find asking them questions. You know, what is it about God that you don't like? And, uh, you know, years ago, I was invited to do a debate at the International Skeptic Society Conference. They held it at Caltech. It was all weekend long. And uh, during that uh, weekend, there was five lectures from world-renowned atheist scientists on the non-existence of God. And at the end, they had me debate the particle physicist, Victor Stenger. Uh, but I stood around afterwards to engage the 750 atheists that flew in from around the world. And I said, you know, this weekend, I've seen a brand new proof for the God of the Bible. And I said, here? At the atheist, uh, at the skeptics said, yes. He says, here's what I've observed. These five scientists you invited to speak, all they talked about was the non-existence of the God of the Bible. They ignored the God of Islam. They ignored the God of Hinduism and Buddhism. The whole focus was on the God of the Bible. The other thing I observed is they were extremely passionate about the non-existence of God. They spoke for an hour each. He says, what this tells me is, is that if they really believed that the God of the Bible didn't exist, they'd be treating him like the tooth fairy or treating him like the great pumpkin. And so what this tells me is they really do believe in the God of the Bible, it's that they don't like him. Well, I had about 40 <laughs> atheists gathered around me, and what they said is that it's not that we hate the God of the Bible, it's that we despise his followers. Mm -hmm. And I began to hear from them stories of how they've been wounded or abused uh, by Christians. But what I share with them is, don't you think it's irrational to let fallen human beings get between you and a perfectly loving and sinless God? And that got them thinking a little bit, and it led to some really interesting conversations. 
but also they were telling me how difficult it was for them to forgive how they'd been offended. But there's another principle there too. It tells us in Matthew 7, if you will not forgive others, my Father will not forgive you. Because each of us as a human being has offended God far more horribly than any human being has offended us. However, the Bible also tells us, if you're having difficulty forgiving someone, God's prepared to help. And what I shared with those atheists that day is, look, I understand that you don't really have the will to forgive those people now, but would you be willing to allow an all-loving God, step by step, to give you the capacity and the ability to forgive these people? Mm. What an incredible thought. You know, and even, even rolling with that idea of if there wasn't so much evidence that there is a God that created it all, they wouldn't be spending their time trying they to reject be spending it, just time. like the tooth fairy. It's what an incredible you know, why thought. Why are they singing songs about the non-existence of God? Yeah, yeah, so. ex exactly, <laughs> exactly. Bo, you have another question from online. Yes. Well, first off, we're getting a ton online. So can you just remind folks how they, I know you answer a lot of these questions on your website, the easiest yeah. way to be able to do that before I ask this question. Sure. I have a Facebook and a Twitter page. Anybody can access it just by putting my name, Hugh Ross Facebook, Hugh Ross Twitter, it'll pop up. Okay. And literally every day I'm answering questions from people uh, on those uh, two media. They're also welcome to contact us at reasons.org. I also have a Q&A page, it's called Questions from Social Media. You see it in our website, and there's hundreds of uh, written answers to the most common questions that people pose to us. Mm. Perfect. All right, so this one has been asked in a number of different ways, so I'm gonna try and pick the you know, one that, we're, and it kind of opens up a can of wormholes. Um, you see what I did there? A can of wormholes. A can yeah. of wormholes, yeah. I yeah. get that. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> All right, I tried. All right, so here's the, here's the question. All right, so how do Christians address the seven days to create universe versus the 13.5 billion years measured or whatever number that is? Obviously, billions of years versus the seven days. Did you I just knock ask somebody out? Question, That's Bo. right. It's like, what? His name's I, Bo Lander. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a right, great question, do. by the way. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's been asked a number of different ways. Obviously, there's a lot of different answers to that, but sure. uh, just to be able to address that in uh, how you've wrestled with it. Right. Well, uh, I briefly told my story Friday night that I was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, I didn't really get to know a Christian until nine years after I'd become a Christian. Uh, and I really didn't pick up a Bible to give it a serious read until I was 17. And the first thing I looked at was the opening chapter. And right away I realized that the word day that's used there must have three distinct uh, literal definitions because three are used in the text. Creation day one, it uses the word day for the daylight hours. Creation day four, it uses the word day for a 24-hour period. And in Genesis 2-4, it uses the word day for the entirety of creation history. Now, if you pick up a Hebrew lexicon, there's a fourth definition, part of the daylight hours. Um, and when I was looking at the creation days, I noticed that each one was accompanied by an evening-morning phrase. And I wasn't sure what the Hebrew meant by evening and morning, but I knew at a minimum it was telling us each of these creation days has a definite start time and a definite end time. And I anticipated finding an evening and a morning for the seventh day. Uh, but we see in the early verses of Genesis 2, there's no evening morning phrase for the seventh day. And so I said, I wonder if we're still in that seventh day as you read on in the Bible, both Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 tell us we're still in God's seventh day. So that would imply that the creation days are long periods of time, six consecutive long periods of time, followed by a seventh uh, long uh, period of time. And at age 17, that was a huge light bulb moment for me uh, because ever since I was 11 years of age, I have been bothered by the fossil record enigma. Why we see all these new phyla, classes, and the orders uh, before humanity, and we see nothing like that after humanity. When I first read the Bible, I said, here's an answer to the fossil record enigma. For six days God creates, on the seventh day he stops creating. The reason why we're not seeing aggressive speciation today 
God's resting from his work of creation, the reason why we see it all through the fossil record before humanity, those are the six days uh, that God creates. I'll just say one other thing. Genesis 1 says God created the human male and the human female on the sixth day. In Genesis 2, God creates Adam first, has him work the garden, uh, has him engage all the soulish animals and give them a name. Uh, he uh, puts them to sleep, performs surgery on them. He recovers from the surgery, and when he sees Eve, he says, at long last. And the text also tells us that before God created Eve, uh, Adam uh, was lonely. And most men, it takes a while for them to feel lonely. So that tells us that the sixth day, likewise, is a significant passage of time. So I never saw any conflict between the book of nature and the book of Scripture. And Psalm 19 tells us God reveals himself in a trustworthy, reliable manner through both the book of nature and through the book of Scripture. And you see that in the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy affirmations, uh, that God indeed reveals himself inerrantly through both the book of nature and the book of Scripture. And when you interpret both properly, they will cohere. They always cohere. And that's the cornerstone of our reasons to believe uh, mission, is that the book of nature will always cohere uh, with the book of Scripture. Both are the inspired uh, message from God, and we can use the book of nature to bring people to the book of Scripture and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Did I answer your question? Very good. All right. Quickly. I, I just need a couple more, so we probably need to shut down the lines where they are. Okay. Just go ahead. So, my name is Stephanie, and I, I grew up and still have the God said it, I believe it, that settles it, amen kind of thing. Um, so, in finance, where I am, not in astrophysicists, I, like, I need layman's terms around the break room to say that God created the earth. I mean, it, rather than just, well, because, because I believe that. Um, why do I believe that? And not in crazy, and, and I don't mean crazy, I'm so sorry. Um, and, <laughs> not in galaxy, like. We've it, never seen her no, before, I don't by know. the way. I'm not, I just want you to know that, Dr. Ross. I've never seen um, her before. But not in terms that I can't explain. I need it in real layman's, like, and, and not just because, just because. I need. <sighs> How can I explain to people, even to my own children, that God created this earth and it's not, um, I don't even know what my question is, I, I, how to explain it in regular terms and regular not terms. in physicist terms. Right. Well, that's kind of what I do for a living is uh, write books <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have a team of scientists with reasons to believe, but we also have a team of editors. You know, my wife was a former English professor. She heads up a team of editors. We call them the translation team. They take <laughs> everything our scientists write and they translate it so that uh, people who are not scientists can read and understand it. I mean, I would recommend for that uh, woman our book, Improbable Planet, uh, which explains. And by the way, what I tell people, give them tidbit pieces. Don't try to give them everything in the book in just uh, 30 uh, seconds. It won't work but get it started and realize God will give you another opportunity. And by the way, most people buy our books to give away to people. And so people say, you know, what about the, the earth? Did God form it? Hey, I got something I think you ought to read. And can we have lunch a week from now? We can talk about it. And so that's why I always carry a big briefcase full of books around is so that I can share with them. Maybe all I got is three minutes but I always make sure I leave something with people. And sometimes all they want is a booklet, so give them a booklet, give them a DVD, but always give them something to get the conversation started and say, hey, if you want to talk about this, uh, here's my email, and uh, feel free to contact me, and we can discuss this at more, more length. Or I know somebody who knows a lot more about this than I do. I'd be happy to put them in touch with you. And a lot, a lot of our scientists will do is we'll actually have uh, online Zoom meetings where we get a bunch of skeptics together and we'll just spend 30 minutes with them answering their questions. I mean, just two weeks ago, I did that with a bunch of uh, scientists at a university in the United Kingdom. We just had 30 minutes on Zoom. 
Uh, there's a lot you can do without getting on an airplane these days. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah, right here. Um, I have a question. Is there an estimate time when the world will end and in that time period will God show up? Will God show up to will stop it? Right. What's going to happen to the earth and when is it going to happen? Uh, well, if we wait long enough, the sun will continue to get brighter and brighter, as I mentioned, and eventually it will be so bright and so big it will incinerate the earth and the moon. That's not going to happen for another four and a half billion years. What it tells us in the Bible is the moment that we who are followers of Jesus Christ take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world, where a significant fraction of those people become disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, then Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take us from this creation to the new creation. And what I wrote in Improbable Planet uh, is that already followers of Jesus Christ have the finances, the people, and the technology to fulfill that great commission in less than a decade. All we lack is the motivation. So if you're in a hurry to leave this universe <laughs> and go to the new creation, get involved in bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ and making them committed disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, let's get it done in a decade. Why wait another 100 years? Love that. Love that. Yeah, buddy. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I have get a close to the microphone. The oh, hi. <laughs> uh, I have a stuttering issue, so, you know. Uh, what is the best argument for the existence of God in science? What is the best argument for the existence of God in time? Uh, I would say the space-time theorems. We now have 30 of those theorems. And as I mentioned last night, those theorems are so compelling. It was God and science. Pardon me? In God science. and science. What, how do you reconcile it, it, God and science? Existence of God existence and science. Existence of God and science together. How do I reconcile the existence of God? Yeah, how do the, and science. How do you science? marry those two together? What he was yeah. Saying, I think. Okay. Well, notice there's 66 books that make up the Bible. There's also several dozen disciplines that make up uh, the record of nature. And so... Every single discipline is giving us compelling evidence for God. And what I love to do is show scientists or people who love science, hey, pick any discipline you want, and I'll show you how we're getting every day more and more evidence in that discipline for the existence of God. You know, we have several scientists, but we have a whole scholar community at universities around the world that uh, are uh, working with us here at Reasons to Believe. And what we do is we read the scientific literature. But I can share this with you. At least a dozen papers get published every day in all the different disciplines that are making a stronger case for the God of the Bible. When I speak on university campuses, I tell the skeptics, if you're not convinced today, wait a month. As I shared last night, the evidence just in the discipline of astrophysics gets a thousand times stronger with every month that goes by. And so, uh, and if you're interested, I, I have a blog called Today's New Reason to Believe. Every Monday it comes out, it's about a thousand words long. And I do that to give you something you can take to the water cooler and say, here, we now have a stronger case for God than we had just a week ago. I don't have time to write one every day or 12 a day, but every week I put out such an article. Love that so much about the work that you all do is a lot of times we as believers, just because the way it's twisted, oh, all of a sudden scientists have found this, and we think, oh, my goodness. And the reality, you go and say, which basically says well, there's a Well, let me God. address that. There's always anomalies in science that don't fit our Christian worldview. And I love to look for those anomalies because this is a chance to actually dig in and see what's going on. Uh, but in the, the past 40 years, what I've discovered, every anomaly that doesn't fit my Christian worldview, if I research it, it gets resolved and it becomes compatible with my Christian worldview. But at the same time, it reveals additional anomalies that I didn't even know were there. But the new anomalies are less problematic. 
And that tells you you're on the pathway to truth, where the anomalies gets fewer and fewer and less and less problematic. Whereas I share with the non-theists, hey, your model for the origin of life, the anomalies are getting more numerous and more problematic. That's an indication you got the wrong model. And you're heading the wrong direction. Right. Love that. Love that. Yeah. My name is, my name is Will Williams. Um, Dr. Ross, I'm hoping you could help give some clarity to uh, you know, some of the talk that I have. Uh, looking, knowing now that we have multiple billions of planets out there, and here we are on Earth, which is one of the many, uh, uh, and we know us being the life form that exists here. Could there be that there are life forms elsewhere that we may not know of, or we not, we're only looking at it based on what we know, who we are, our body, uh, uh, and there could be other life forms elsewhere in the different dimensions that we cannot relate to. Could you just help give some clarity to that? Right. Well, we're talking about different dimensions. Uh, yes, I would argue that there's a possibility for life. After all, God created two species of intelligent life. One species that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, subjected uh, to the space-time dimensions of the universe, and another species, the angels, that are not. So yeah, if we're talking uh, beyond the universe, I'm good with that. But within the universe, what we're seeing is, yes, we now see 5,000 planets outside of our solar system, but not a single one of those planets is like anything like the planets in our solar system. And we see hundreds of millions of stars, and uh, not one of them is like our star the sun. It's a theme you see in my next book, uh, Design to the Core. We live in a super galaxy cluster that's starkly different from any other super galaxy cluster we observe. It's designed, the others are not. We see that for a galaxy cluster. We see that for the local group. We see that for our galaxy. We see that for the local bubble in which we exist in our galaxy. We see it for the local fluff that surrounds our solar system. We see it for our star. We see it for the planets. And it goes all the way down to the fundamental particles. We really do have an overwhelming case that all of this was designed to make a home for us human beings where we can be redeemed from our sin and evil. Amen. I like it. All right, last question, and then Dr. Ross will be out at his table. Sorry about that for time. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Ross. My name is Amanda. Um, <clears throat> you talked a lot about how precise it is to have life here on Earth. Do you think, in your opinion, it is possible for us to create life on other planets, for example, Mars? Is it possible for us to what? on Mars, like what Elon Musk is trying to do. Like, right. Yeah. Well, there's a big effort today to try to make Mars habitable. Uh, it is conceivable. Uh, it can be done for about a hundred quadrillion dollars. Uh, <laughs> and it would make Mars habitable for 60 years. Then you've got to spend that hundred quadrillion dollars again. So uh, I think we better take good care of planet Earth. Uh, and I'm rather skeptical that it could even be done because the chemistry of Mars is so different from the chemistry of Earth. Uh, so, as so I was showing with the audience last night, there's no way Matt Damon's going to be able to grow potatoes on Mars. Uh, <laughs> the chemistry of the soil simply forbids it. You'd have to bring it all from planet Earth. And as far as being able to create life, um, you know, one of the ways I've been engaging non theists is saying, you know, we're very intelligent, we're knowledgeable, we've got great technology, and yet when we try to make life from scratch in the lab, we can't even do the baby steps. We can re-engineer uh, some bacteria, and it's amazing what we've been able to do, uh, but we can't even take amino acids to make a simple protein. Uh, the best we've been able to do is get up to about 50 amino acids joined together on a mineral straight, but what we discover is the adhesion to that clay mineral becomes so strong, we can't pull this tiny bit of a protein off of it. And we don't see the building blocks uh, for life in the interstellar molecular clouds. We've yet to discover a single amino acid nucleobase or ribose sugar in any of these interstellar molecular clouds. However, I'm on record, we soon will. We will discover them at a part per billion, or if a few fractions of a part per billion. But at that low concentration, 
uh, that's of no uh, value at all for a naturalistic origin of life. And I love a paper that got published in the British journal Nature a few months back. It was written by a chemist who was doing these origin of life experiments in the lab and said, we keep committing the, the, uh, the dilemma of God uh, fallacy repeatedly. In other words, we make things happen, but only because we engage a lot of technology, knowledge, and intelligence. This doesn't prove that it happens naturalistically. It simply proves that someone way more intelligent, knowledgeable, and better financed right. than us uh, did it in the first place. And he says, as I read the scientific literature, every paper in Origin of Life Chemistry, we see uh, the uh, dilemma of God fallacy being committed at least 12 times. And he ends the paper by saying, we Origin of Life researchers need to tell the readers how many times we're committing the dilemma of God fallacy. But he says, my guess is it's never less than 12 times. Wow, that's pretty impressive. And, and here's, here's what's become very obvious for me as I was just thinking through this whole day, is, is I've got a lot of stuff I need to read about. So, um, well, me too. <laughs> yeah, I know it. Well, I, I will tell you, man, go to Reasons to Believe. He, uh, Dr. Ross and his team, they take all the new studies and they will address it. And it's in so interesting how much more that just continues to point to the fact there is a God. Even the stuff that they create, you're basically saying there has to be a creator in everything they do. Y'all give Dr. Ross a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Dr. Ross, as we close, and then I'm just going to pray, and he's going to be out at the book table, although everybody's already bought other books, but you can find out how to get your, your copy of his books. You know, one of the things that I see as a pastor a lot of times is we delve into the scientific literature. And today, just as a pastor, I've, I've, I've heard people, you know, young earth, old earth, you know, literal day, metaphorical day. All of the, a lot of times, I think, when we are trying to share the faith with others, sometimes we get bogged down on stuff that doesn't really matter. So final thoughts on really helping us connect uh, the gospel and the Christian message uh, with those who are lost or atheist or questioning. So kind of put all that together so we don't, as believers, go off on our own rabbit trails that don't matter, right. that people don't care about. And so give us your closing thoughts. Well, I would take them to 2 Corinthians 5, which says that we who are followers of Jesus Christ are ambassadors on behalf of God to bring unbelievers to peace with God. And yes, we Christians have a reputation of fighting one another on the non-essentials of the Christian faith. And people have been doing that for a long time. And I tell people, if it's not in the creeds, don't fight over it. Yeah. And uh, the age of the earth is not in the creeds. Uh, how you get baptized is not in the creeds. Uh, and so let's not fight. Our, I mean, let's remember, non-Christians watch how we treat one another. That's right. And the science-faith issues tend to be particularly acrimonious. And I share with people who have a different model on science and faith than we do at Reasons to Believe, let's be charitable to one another because non-Christians are watching us and they see us being vindictive towards one another. They're going to not want to touch us with a 10-foot pole. But as Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. So if we can express charity towards one another, this is going to have a big impact on encouraging non-Christians to trust us to be their ambassador to make peace with God. That's fantastic. Give him a hand. and uh... Thank you. Dr. Ross, if you're ever looking for another church to serve as a pastoral astrophysicist, we've got a spot right here at All Cottonwood right, Creek. You. So let's pray. <laughs> God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity just to host and ask anything we can. And just uh, that we're not afraid uh, to let people ask questions, ask, ask tough, tough questions, and engage our culture as it relates to science and the faith. Thank you so much, God, uh, for Dr. Hugh Ross and Reasons to Believe and all that they do and the questions they answer. Continue to bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great, great day.